This is a mental health hacks episode, meaning I'm going to share with you some of the best and in some cases, the latest research from the fields of neuroscience and positive psychology around how you can take the reins of your mind, your mood, your nervous system, your well-being. If you've ever met someone who's genuinely thriving, someone who is radiant, magnetic, and wildly alive and wondered, what's their secret? Well, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the Be Marvelous Podcast. The truth is that if you aren't proactive about training your brain and your nervous system to work for you, then there's a very almost definite chance that the world is training your brain and your nervous system to work against you. Now, I say your brain and your nervous system, really it's your whole organism because the whole organism, the brain, the nervous system, the skin, the organs, everything, the, these, all these parts are constantly in conversation with one another. You're not aware of it. You're not aware that your spleen is talking to your kidney is talking to your shoulders, you know, like that's just happening in the background. And we're going to get into some of the subconscious stuff that's happening in a minute, but they're all talking to each other. And so that's why I don't want to limit it to just what's in your head, just your thoughts. It is a dynamic system. We talk about the mind-body connection, but it's really mind-body nervous system connection. All of it should be operating harmoniously. (laughs) Oftentimes it's not. And oftentimes that is exactly what gets us to start paying attention to our mental and emotional well-being in the first place, right? We hit a wall. We have a breakdown. We lose our shit. We struggle with an addiction. We struggle with depression. We struggle with anxiety or panic attacks or you name it, right? At some point, the system has been sending signals long enough saying distress, 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 and we've been ignoring it long enough and allowing the world, life, the external world to train our brain and nervous systems for us. And eventually the system starts to fall apart. And that's when we go seeking solutions and answers and therapy and medication and treatments and all this stuff. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can make changes daily, small changes, but really important and profound changes, even though from an effort perspective, it requires quite a small amount of effort just done consistently. And those small efforts can have a huge and positive impact on your mental and emotional well-being. That's what we're going to get into today. Number one, your brain and your nervous system, really. Your brain is not here to keep you happy. Your brain's primary directive and your nervous systems too is to keep you safe, to keep you alive and to keep you safe. And if you look at that directive from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes a lot of sense because when our species began to evolve early in our history, we faced a lot of external threats. It was really easy to die and really hard to survive. And so the brain, the primitive brain, evolved to be very good at identifying threats. This went on for thousands of years. So that primitive part of your brain, which is also often called the reptilian brain, is super efficient, super speedy. It uses very little energy to do its job compared to other parts of your brain. It's really good at what it does. And because it's so good and so fast and so mature, we'll say, the newer part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, the part that makes decisions, or at least the decisions you are aware of, is the one that understands language and the one that we think of when we think of the human brain. What makes us human is this ability to, to think and connect and create AI and send rockets to the moon. That part of the brain is in its infancy. That part of the brain is an energy hog. It requires a ton of energy. It's way slower than our primitive brain. And meanwhile, it thinks it's all that, right? Like we all think that's what's running the show. I'm here to tell you that is rarely the case. 95%, roughly 95% of all of the activity in your brain, the whole brain is unconscious. You're not aware of it, in other words. 
Okay, so the, the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that you associate with being you, that is generally not running the show, even when you think it is. And the reason why this is so important is because if you don't train your brain and your nervous system to be less vigilant, <laughs> take the gas pedal off of the sympathetic response, which is your fight or flight, which is your like, oh my God, there's a saber toothed tiger around every corner mode. You're going to suffer. You're going to struggle, right? You're going to live in a lot of fear and anxiety and distress. Okay. Number two, that's subconscious thing we were talking about. So 95% roughly of your brain activity is unconscious. And that includes things like making sure your heart beats, making sure you digest food, making sure that when you're having a conversation with someone, you don't have to think about the next word or how to make your mouth move to form that next sentence, right? You're not always in beginner mode. A lot of things, once you learn them, run on autopilot, right? Like when you, if you learn how to drive stick shift, in the beginning, you really had to think about each step, right? What gear you put things in and what are you doing with your foot on the clutch and with the gas pedal and on top of it, steering the wheel. You had to think about all these things. It was not autopilot mode yet. It was using your conscious brain, using that 5%. At some point, you developed a neural pathway. You learned how to do those things enough that they became automatic and they went into that unconscious, like it just happens on autopilot mode. A lot of things that you do are on autopilot mode, the vast majority. And where this gets dicey and why training is so important is because there are lots of things that end up in autopilot that are not serving you, okay? Things like beliefs that you have about how the world works, about are people good or bad? Is life easy or hard? All of these things, many of which got coded earlier in our lives and were shaped by our primary caregivers, our households, our communities, our cultures, the time period in which we were growing up. All of those things helped to create some autopilot programs, we'll say, some pieces of code that now run without your conscious awareness and they can keep you stuck and they can keep you suffering and they can keep you from living marvelously, from feeling your best. And that brings me to number three, which is that there is this thing called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the brain's and nervous system's ability to rewire itself. So you can create new neural pathways, like brand new ones. For example, when you learn a new skill, let's say you just learned how to play piano, you are creating new neural pathways around how to move your hands, how to synchronize your fingers on the keys, how to read music, et cetera. So you can create new neural pathways. You can prune old pathways. And some of that happens simply by not using them, right? So when you change a habit, when you create a new habit and you stop using the old habit, you get rid of those neural pathways or they basically become decommissioned, right? You don't need them anymore. And this is a dynamic system. So you can influence neuroplasticity, not just through the brain. In other words, not just through thought or mental activity, but through sensory experience, through movement, through the physiology of the whole organism, in other words. So you can create neuroplasticity by what you do, by what you think and what you experience. And you can do that no matter how old you are. So those three principles you need to understand in order to understand that this is happening, number one, to all of us, okay? Number two, there's a really good biological reason for it, right? It's not a bad thing in and of itself. It just is. And that number three, you can change the parts of it that aren't working for you. And it, it's easier than you think, meaning it doesn't require a huge amount of effort. It doesn't require crazy technology or it's not only accessible to people that have a lot of resources and privilege. Some of these things are super simple. That's why I'm sharing them with you today. You can start doing them today and they can literally change the way your brain works, the way your um, nervous system responds and the way that you function and perform in the world and the way you feel about life and yourself, whole experience. I want to share something that will, I think, illustrate this point. And it comes from a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt, who talked about two ways to get at the truth of something. One way he calls the way of the scientist. And the other way is the way of the lawyer. So the scientist, the way of the scientist involves gathering evidence, uh, looking for patterns and 
forming theories to explain our observations. And then you test those theories, right? A lawyer, on the other hand, begins with a conclusion. They then seek evidence that will support that conclusion and also will attempt to discredit any evidence that does not support that conclusion. So the scientist is saying, let me take a look at what is here and see what I can, how I can make sense of it. Let me find some patterns and things that I recognize. And then based on that information, I'm going to form a theory and then I'm going to test that theory. And the lawyer says, I have the answer. I already know the answer. Now I'm going to gather evidence that supports what I believe is the answer and discredits anything that refutes it. Our brains are a mix of the two. And most of us think that our brains are more the scientist. Most of us believe we make logical decisions. We do our research. We think it through, right? That is how we do things. But what the research shows is that most human thought processes start with a belief and then go for evidence, not vice versa. So in other words, your brain is an outstanding lawyer and a decent scientist. Or another way of saying it is that your unconscious mind is a master at taking limited data and constructing a version of a world that appears realistic, that is totally believable, like you don't even realize that you're doing this, and then presents that to the conscious mind. And the conscious mind says, oh, this is what it is. This is true. And that's where things can go wrong, right? Because if the belief is, or the worldview is that you are not worthy or you are not good enough, when that's the belief, and now your outstanding lawyer is just looking for evidence to support that, and their conscious mind isn't even aware that this is happening, do you see now how your brain and your nervous system can work against you? Mental fitness hack number one is do not look at your phone first thing in the morning. In fact, don't look at it for at least the first hour, if possible, and here's why. When you check your phone immediately after waking up, it forces your brain to skip two very important stages in the waking cycle. It skips those two stages and therefore primes your brain for distraction and distress. So it's like the modern day equivalent of being woken up by a saber-toothed tiger every morning. It's slight, slight exaggeration, but not really in terms of its impact on your nervous system. So let's take a closer look. Here's what happens in the sleep-wake cycle. When you're asleep, when you're in deep sleep, this is known as the delta state. This is the most restful state for your brain and your nervous system to be in. Everything's slowed down. Your respiratory rate slows down. Everything is resting. Okay, that's when you're in the delta stage. And when you come out of deep sleep, normally you go into the theta stage, which is like that daydreamy state where you're not fully unconscious, but you're not conscious yet. You might recognize this as when you're like drifting into or out of sleep. So it's that sort of daydreaming, that's theta. And then from there, you go into alpha. The alpha state is when you are now awake, you're conscious, but you're not processing a ton of information yet. You're just like starting to come online, right? Like you press the power button, the machine is powering up, the computer is powering up and doing its like startup cycle. And then after that happens for a bit, then you go into beta. That is your fully alert and awake state of consciousness. That's how I am right now. Hopefully how you are as you're listening to this. That is our normal, fully awake, fully functioning and online brain state. When you pick up your phone first thing in the morning, what happens is you skip the theta and the alpha stages. So you go directly from the delta, from deep sleep to beta, wide awake. That's why I'm bringing up the saber-toothed tiger as the equivalent to the phone. That is jarring. That is priming you for a stress response. Especially if when you pick up the phone, the first thing you see is something negative or stressful. Maybe it's an angry email from a customer from your boss, or it's a headline about earthquake that happened overnight or a shooting or your ex posts a picture of their engagement on Instagram, whatever it is, right? It, that is a terrible thing to do to your nervous system. And so in effect, what you are doing is you are training your mind or your nervous system by choosing to pick up your phone first thing in the morning and you're training it to be hypervigilant 
to start off the day in fight or flight mode. And I cannot tell you how many people do this. Honestly, like it's an epidemic or a pandemic. It's some kind of endemic <laughs> because most people do this. We use our phones as our alarm clocks. So even if we tell ourselves we're not going to scroll through Instagram or we're not going to open our email or we're not going to look at the news first thing in the morning, the sheer fact that, that phone is in your hand, there's just too good of a chance that it will. And even if you don't scroll on anything, even if you use it for an alarm clock, well, let me share a study with you that will make you not want to do that either. Because it turns out that the mere presence of a smartphone in the room with you can decrease your cognitive capacity. So if I can leave you with just one tip, just one hack, one thought, one piece of advice, one thing I hope you'll do after listening to this episode to improve your mental and emotional well-being, to begin training your brain and your nervous system to work for you is do not have your phone in your room when you sleep. Do not have your phone in your room when you're doing something important. Do not pick up your phone first thing in the morning. Give yourself at least 30 minutes, preferably at least an hour to wake up organically before you pick up the smartphone and allow it to have an impact on your mental and emotional state. Mental fitness hack number two, rest. Well, that's right, folks. Rest. Mental and emotional rest. Now, when I say rest, I want to be clear, it, that can take several different forms. So rest for your brain and your nervous system can come in the form of sleep. So a good night's sleep. It can come in the form of a nap. It can come in the form of meditation or meditative-like activity, or it can come in the form of breath work. And the fifth one I'll throw in there is through non-sleep deep rest or NSDR, which is a term coined by a neuroscientist named Andrew Huberman. But any of those are best, most recommended ways to give your brain and your nervous system some rest. Now, and lastly, I'll say before we wrap that all the things that I shared today, these are the kinds of exercises that we bake into our inner workouts at the Marvelous Mental Emotional Fitness Gym. These are the kinds of things that we cover and go deep on and support you in actually practicing and keeping you accountable and consistent, actually doing the stuff in the Marvelous Mental Emotional Fitness Boot Camp. These are the kinds of things that our community is always talking about. We are cheering each other on. You can find accountability partners. You can work with one of our coaches. You don't have to do this alone is really my message here. That's why we built Marvelous, because we wanted to make it easy for you, accessible for you to learn these tools, to use them, to access them anytime, to enjoy practicing them, and to do so consistently because consistency is key. Also, to give you the support because it is much easier to change and grow and improve and train when you're in community, when you're doing that in community, when you have peers and partners and coaches who are doing it with you and cheering you on and celebrating your victories and picking you up when you fall down. That's what Marvelous is about. So if you're interested in that level of support in working on this stuff with others who are also dedicated to training their brains and optimizing their nervous systems to getting in the best mental emotional shape of their lives. I encourage you, I welcome you to check out Marvelous. Go to bemarvelous.com, B-E-M-A-R-V-E-L-U-S.com. Hit the big free trial button anywhere on the site. Sign up for a free seven-day trial. Check it out for yourself. I will be back next week with another episode. Until then, have a marvelous fucking week. I love you. If you've ever met someone who's genuinely thriving, someone who is radiant, magnetic, and wildly alive, and wondered, what's their secret? Well, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the Be Marvelous Podcast.